lot of the archers, if you know the archers. And so for those of you who don't think we sing any old music, boy, that's like I told Nancy. She needed bell-bottom britches, and Ricky needed long hair. So that's back when the archers were happening. I'm glad you're here. Are you glad you're here? Now, some of you adults look like you sponsored the prom last night and got a prom hangover. So wake up. It's the Lord's Day. It's Palm Sunday. And while you're waking up, take your Bible and turn with me, if you would, to the book of John chapter 12. Also, I want you to find the book of Revelation chapter 7, our primary passage, John 12. For those of you uh, on Facebook live watching us, if you'll get your source of Scripture, we would love for you to worship with us by reading the Word of God today as well. John chapter 12, verse 12 through 19, and then the book of Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 through 10, a little bit later on. And welcome to worship again on this Palm Sunday. The title of my message today is Follow Jesus for Who He Is. You know, we live in a day and age where people want to have followers. In fact, um, we talk around the office about how many people follow our Facebook page. Maybe some of you are on Twitter or Instagram or whatever, and you have followers that follow you. I know a lot of pro athletes, uh, they try to get a lot of followers. And so people are following a lot of people these days on technology. Well, I want to go back old school if I can, and I want to ask us today from the Word of God, why do we follow Jesus? Do we follow Him for who He really is? You know, the longer I live and the longer I serve in the local church, it's sad to say that I've seen people who've made a profession of faith. Some of them have been actively involved serving the Lord and followed Him through believer's baptism, yet they fall away from God. In fact, some of them don't even think God exists any longer. Some of those people that I've witnessed that this is their testimony, they're lay people. They're just like you. Some are vocational ministers like me. Some are missionaries on the foreign mission field. Some are even evangelists who once used to follow Jesus, but for some strange reason have fallen away from the church. In fact, some have even said that Jesus no longer exists. Now, there are several reasons why people have spiritual failures. Sometimes things in ministry don't go the way they thought. I can't tell you how many youth pastors, and I used to be one, but I can't tell you how many youth pastors got into the youth pastor ministry only to get out because they thought you could go to camp every day, wear shorts all the time, and go ski trips, and you didn't have any responsibility. And then when they realized it's a ministry to young people and their families, and you actually have to work, they said, oh, I didn't sign up for this. I'm out. I know some pastor's wives who their husband was called to the pastorate. And then they walked away. They said, listen, I didn't sign up to be a preacher's wife. And so I know firsthand, and I'm sure you do too, that sometimes people get out of ministry for multiple reasons. Sometimes people get away from the church because they've been hurt by the church. Now, I don't want you to raise your hand today, but there's a good, very good chance that some of you in this room or some of you on Facebook You've been hurt by the church, and, and you're a little bit skeptical of the church. Some people get out away from the, the Lord and walk away from ministry and church because someone that they respected in the church who's, has hurt them. Some people leave the church because they don't get their way in the church. Some people leave the church because the church built a new building and their color scheme wasn't chosen. I'm not making that up, folks. That's real life. There are many, many reasons as to why people fall away from faith. Some people fall away from faith because they've been taught something and then they discover in the Bible that's not true and they thought, well, if I can't respect the person that taught me that, I need to walk away. And then some people get away from faith. Some people leave the church just because of pure big time sin in their life. When people fall away, when people quit following Jesus, we should never be surprised. Now, I didn't say we shouldn't be hurt because it hurts us. You've heard me say from this pulpit for 13 years, if God leads you to another church by the Holy Spirit of God, get there as quick as you can. I don't want to lose you. I love being your pastor. But if the Holy Spirit leads you, get there. Now, if you leave because you're mad, don't make somebody else's church mad because of your disgruntledness. But I want us to see today that some people fall away, some people quit following Jesus, and we should not be shocked by that. In fact, in John chapter 12, verse 4, about eight verses from where we're going to start today, we see a guy named Judas Iscariot. 
And the Bible says, let's just look at that very quickly, just so that you'll know what the Scripture says in verse 4. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, who was about to betray him. We shouldn't be surprised that people leave the church. In the book of Acts chapter 5, we read about Ananias and Sapphira. Early members of the early church walked away and got struck dead. In the book of Acts chapter 8, we read about Simon the magician professed faith in Christ, got baptized, tried to buy some of the power from the apostles so that he could do miracles and perform magic, got away from the faith. Just a few examples of why some people follow Jesus, listen to me, for the wrong reasons. This is Palm Sunday. We're about to read about the triumphal entry. There are different reasons, as I said earlier, why people leave the faith. But I believe the root cause is that they really never fully understood who Jesus really was. I'm convinced that's why people leave the faith. They lose sight of who Jesus Christ really is. Dear friends, we have to understand the identity of Jesus Christ today because it's crucial to our eternal destiny. That is why John said in John chapter 20, verse 31, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. What that verse says is that if I, if you truly understand, if we really believe in who Jesus is, we will have everlasting eternal life. But if you have false notions about who God is, if you have false hopes about who Jesus is and what he will do, you're going to be disappointed somewhere along the journey called life. Two years ago, I walked the path that we're about to read about in this triumphal entry. I walked down that, ser- that very same narrow road, if you want to call it, path, alleyway, whatever you want to call it. And I remember it as we walked there, and I remember as our guide stopped and threw his headset, and he said, folks, this is the path, this is the road which Jesus went down to the week that we call the triumphal entry. It's the beginning of Passion Week. It says Jesus was going to Jerusalem. And I thought to myself, that's not a good name. Why would we call it the triumphal entry? What it ought to be called is the tragic entry. Because I remember that in Luke chapter 19, verse 41, that Jesus in that very same place, he stopped and he looked at the city and he wept over that city. I listened to the diagram and and the things that our guide said and I said to myself, why would this be called the triumphal entry when it really should be labeled the tragic entry? A little background real quick. The crowds lined that street. It was narrower than the center aisle of our church. The crowds lined that street. They were excited. For the long expected king of Israel was coming to their town. But they were expecting a political king. They were expecting a military king who could bring justice to Rome and provide eventual peace and prosperity for their nation. Those people that lined that narrow road, they weren't interested in a spiritual king. They weren't interested in somebody who would come and forgive their sins and to cleanse them from all unrighteousness. No, they wanted a different kind of king. You see, many in the crowd that day followed Jesus for the wrong reasons. And it still happens today. If you have your Bible, look with me now. At the book of John, chapter 12, beginning in verse 12 through 19. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees. Underline that, it's very important. They took branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him. And they were crying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey, and he sat on it just as it was written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. 
His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. Verse 17, the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing? Look, the world is going after him. Now I want you to follow along with me closely today. I've got three points to the sermon as we consider the topic, why do we follow Jesus? We need to follow him for who he is. For the first time in this setting, in the public ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, he deliberately staged a public demonstration. He set this demonstration up to prove to the people for the first time that he truly was the Messiah. And he did it in Jerusalem at the most widely attended feast of all feasts. The estimates were that there were a million pilgrims, a million people in Jerusalem for this feast. It was Passover. And Jesus sent two of his disciples to get the donkey and her colt. In the triumphal entry, Jesus was declaring himself to be Israel's Messiah. But not the kind of Messiah that they were expecting. He didn't ride into town on a big strapping war horse. He didn't come into town with an entourage of military might behind him. He didn't come into town as you and I would expect a king or a warrior to come into town. He rode on a donkey. Do you understand that? Do you get that concept? In fact, every time I think that, I go back to my childhood days. I was raised in Mesquite, Texas. Every Friday and Saturday night, you could go to the Mesquite Championship Rodeo from April to September. And when it got time for the bull riding, always, every night, just like clockwork, one of the clowns, the bullfighter clowns, would ride out on a donkey and everybody would just roar in laughter. I mean, you don't expect somebody's going to fight bulls to come in on a donkey. Dude, get one of those horses that we've seen all night long. And I always think, here's the Messiah, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And he rides in not on a war horse, not on a chariot with other chariots surrounding him, not with secret service by his side, but he comes in on a donkey. This public display by Jesus sent the Jewish leaders into a tizzy. To say the least, they were bent out of shape. They absolutely, without question, wanted to kill Jesus, but not at the Passover because they knew if they tried to kill him at Passover with a million pilgrims there that they would have the riot of all kinds of riots on their hand. You think you saw bad riots this past summer in America? This would have been multitudes worse. So today... I want to encourage you and me to make sure that we follow Jesus because of who he is. Not because of what we think he might provide for us. Point number one, don't follow Jesus for temporary benefits that he might provide for you. In John's gospel, if you were to read the whole gospel, Jesus speaks about different groups of people that were in the gathering of a million. It was the triumphal entry. One of the groups, as I said, were the pilgrims who had come to Jerusalem. They had come for the feast. They had taken palm branches and they went to meet Jesus. In verse 12 and 13 of our passage, we see that they were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That was the Old Testament prophecy from Psalm 118, verse 25 and 26. Their hopes were fueled, if you'll go back to our text, their hopes were fueled in this Messiah, because their hopes were fueled, because they were people who had witnessed Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. So they thought to themselves, if Jesus can raise a dead man from the dead, surely he can do what I need. I mean, after all, if Jesus can raise a dead man from the grave, surely he can give me a little bit more money, because that's all that I need. I mean, if Jesus can raise a dead man from the grave, surely he can help me pass an exam that I didn't study for. 
If Jesus raised a dead man from the grave, surely he can help my kid get into the college that's in their top two. If Jesus can raise Lazarus from the dead, surely he will help me get the job above all jobs that I've dreamed of all my life. Folks, Jesus didn't come to meet the need of the people and what they wanted. He came to completely change their life. He didn't come for temporary satisfaction. He came to completely turn their life over to him. They walked away that day with all the excitement and all the joy that they gained from the disciples. And even the disciples that day were a little skeptical. I want you to know today that if you're following Jesus just for temporary pleasure, if you're following Jesus just because you think there's a quick fix, if you're following Jesus like a man I met several years ago at the small church I served in, about three months before school board elections, guess who started showing up? Oh yeah, his name was on the roll. It'd been there a long time, but we had to dust it off to see if it was still there when he started coming. And about two weeks after the election, Guess whose name gathered dust again? You see, we've become people, if we're not careful, not all, I understand, but we've become a people who follow Jesus for temporary satisfaction. What he can do for us, what he can do right now. Jesus does for us what's best in our life. If we're following Jesus for the health and the wealth prosperity, we're following him for the wrong reasons. If you're following today Jesus Christ, whether in this room or on the internet, if you're following Jesus just so that you can get all the goodies in life that you think you need, you're following as these people were for the wrong reason. Can I ask you today? Can I encourage you today? Don't follow Jesus because of the temporal benefits that he might provide for you. Instead, secondly, follow Jesus for who he truly is. God's Messiah and King. If my faith and your faith rest upon the person of Jesus Christ as spoken of in the Bible, then we will not be shaken whether we're poor or rich, healthy or not. If our faith truly rests on the shoulders of Jesus Christ and on the promises that he's made in the Word of God throughout eternity, our faith will be stable and we will follow for the right reasons. Last summer, from this very pulpit, I buried one of our precious ladies in our church, Ariane McKeecher. And about two or three hours before the service, Ken brought to me an email. And Ken shared with me in that email that when Ariane in the hospital in Tyler, struggling with COVID, knew that her days were over, she spent about 20 minutes with a nurse there in that room. And she said these words, would you please tell my family, tell my husband, I'm not scared. I know exactly where I'm going. A testimony of a lady who didn't follow Jesus just for temporary satisfaction. Didn't follow Jesus just for temporary healing. She followed Jesus. She had a solid faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because what she knew the word of God meant. She followed Jesus because he was truly God's Messiah and King. If your faith rests on the person of Jesus Christ, you've got solid faith. Now I want you to go back to your passage with me in John chapter 12, verse 12 through 19. And our passage reveals to us several proofs that Jesus truly is God's Messiah and King. First of all, we read about fulfilled prophecies that prove that Jesus is the Messiah. In our passage of Scripture, verse 12 through 19, Jesus shares two Old Testament prophecies. John wrote these for our reminder. First of all, we already referenced Psalm 118, verse 25 and 26. They were shouting, waving palm branches, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's exactly Old Testament prophecy. Then we come and we see another prophecy. Fear not, look at verse 15. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Listen to the book of Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 
In just seven verses, two Old Testament prophecies fulfilled at the time of the triumphal entry. A display that Jesus is God's Messiah. But secondly, we see and we follow Jesus because he's God's Messiah and King because his works of power prove that he's God's King. John does not mention here that the young colt on which Jesus rode was trained, or we would call him broken. Now, I don't know how many of you here are horse people. Some of you are. You have horses, you ride horses. But I remember years ago, the Brown family that resided in Mesquite, Texas, rented some land in Forney. Back then, it was a long trip to Forney. And we had some horses. And my dad had the brilliant idea of buying a new paint horse. He stood 15 and a hand, 15 and a half hands tall. If you're in the horse business, that's up there pretty good. And he decided to put me on him first. I was up. I mean, I was a young person. I was strapping, big, strong, knew everything. I mean, I'm up to the challenge. That's why young people are. Now, I got on that horse, and we went to the back of the pasture. I, I'm going to just guess seven or eight, 900 yards, maybe 1,000 yards deep. And as I turned him around to come back, I don't know. He must have had 20-20 vision because as soon as his eyes focused on the barn, it was all off. I couldn't stop him. I don't care how long Terry Boyd, your horseman, I pulled on those reins. He wouldn't stop. He was bucking. He was kicking. I thought he was a bucking bronc from the local rodeo, mesquite. I couldn't stop. And when we got back to the barn, I finally stopped head in to the side of the barn because he threw me off. Now, we found out later that that horse had only been ridden about a half a dozen times. That's why the guy got rid of him, couldn't do anything with him. So that's why I always believe that animals ought to have a disclaimer note, you know, just letting you know what's going on. But Jesus rode in on an untrained, an untamed animal. He's proving his power as God's Messiah. John mentions in verse 1 that he raised Lazarus from the dead. In the Gospel of John, there are seven miracles that our Lord performed, proving that he's Jesus, he's God's Messiah and King. But also, I want you to look at your text, because there's proven to us in this passage of Scripture, we follow Jesus because he truly is God's Messiah and King, because he was in control of the circumstances based on his father's timetable. This past week, we as the pastoral staff here at First Baptist Church, we started reading a book by Alan Fadling. I encourage you to read the book. It's entitled, An Unhurried Leader. Now, chapter one is all we've read so far, and it's already reminded me that I need to slow down. It's already reminded me as a Christian, that I need to get on my Father's timetable. It's already reminded me that all the stuff that we're bombarded with, if it's not on the timetable of God, it's not worth doing. And so when I look at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Messiah and King, coming in to the, to the city for the people, the Feast of Passover, a million pilgrims, I'm reminded that there's proof that he is who he said he is because he's in God's timetable. He didn't let things get out of hand. How many times do you know in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ did Jesus do something, perform a miracle, and he instantly got away from the crowds? All the time. He fed 5,000 plus people with a little boy sack lunch and he got away. He healed somebody and he got away. He didn't stand around for people to pat him on the back and to, to have a big pepper. No, he would do ministry and he got away. But this time he deliberately planned this triumphal entry. All throughout Jesus' ministry, folks, we're reminded that he followed the timetable of the sovereign God. And Jesus knew when he approached Jerusalem on this day that it was his time. His time had come. He had raised Lazarus. The Jewish leaders were intensified. They were thrilled. They were ramped up. They had done everything they could, and now they were going to kill him. 
And Jesus didn't withdraw. Jesus didn't get away. Jesus rode right into their presence during Passover. So Jesus changed the ministry strategy, we would say. And he openly presented himself as the Messiah. He openly rode in to the city. He forced the hand of the Jewish leaders to go against their plan not to kill him during the feast. So the real message for us today on this Palm Sunday and this triumphal entry is to make sure that you follow Jesus for who he is, not what you think he may provide for you. He provides forgiveness of sin. That's why we follow him. He provides everlasting life. That's why we should follow him. He provides real peace that no one can comprehend. That's why we follow him. But let me offer one final question observation. It's point number three if you're taking notes on the back of your bulletin. As I read this story, as I wrap it up in John chapter 12, I would say this. You can be against Jesus if you want to, but ultimately you're going to lose and he's going to be victorious. Okay, let me say that again. You can do everything you want to. You can be against Jesus if you want to. But ultimately, if you are against Jesus, listen to me, you are going to lose. He will be victorious. Verse 19 shows the frustration of the Pharisees. Look at what they said. Look at your text. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you're gaining nothing. Look, the world is going after him. In other words, They were saying there when they saw all these people, the crowds were celebrating Jesus. In other words, the Pharisees were saying, all the things that we've tried to do, all the traps we've tried to set, all the false accusations and fake news we've brought against this guy have failed us. Look at what these people are doing. They are going after him. But John wants us to understand that even though by the end of the week, the tide had turned and the Jewish leaders were gloating, and boasting, and bragging, and throwing their chest out around town because of their victory, it was (laughs) short-lived. Jesus was crucified. To some, they thought he'd lost. But he gave his life willing. And just a few hours later, he kicked the snot out of the grave and rose again. He did. You can be against Jesus all you want to. Listen to me. If you never come back here, please listen. You can be against him all that you want to, but you are going to be a loser because Jesus is victorious. Jesus is has won, and he will win again. And if you reject him, if you follow him for the wrong reasons, if you don't know his identity, if he's not your Savior and Lord, based on the truth of God's word, then you will lose in the end. So my question today is this. Why do you follow Jesus? Why? Why are you here today? I refereed a ball game last night with a guy, and he said, our church in Tyler, we're doing two Sunday morning services and one on Sunday night. He said, what we're finding is everybody wants to come to Sunday night. Yeah, because everybody wants to sleep in on Sunday morning. I mean, that's a no-brainer. Yeah. So he said, now we got to change it because we got more than we can handle on Sunday night. We can't social distance because everybody wants Why are you here today at this time? Why are you here? Why do you follow Jesus Christ? The right reason to follow Jesus is because of who he is. He's God's anointed one. He's the rightful king over every heart and every life. He, we follow him because he died for our sins. He arose from the grave and he's coming back in power and glory to claim us and to take us home to be with him. That's the right reason on this Palm Sunday to follow Jesus. Would you go with me very, very quickly to the book of Revelation chapter 9? Revelation chapter 9. 
I'm sorry, Revelation 7, verse 9, 9 and 10. Revelation 7 and 9. After this, I looked, and behold, there was a great multitude that no one could number. From every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with what? What? Palm branches. Remember I told you to underline it? In their hands. And they were crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The only other time in the New Testament that palm branches are mentioned. At the feast, the lambs were being sacrificed. But at the end times, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ himself, is sacrificed for the sins of all mankind. Today, dear friends, why do you follow Jesus? Some follow because they're in it for temporal satisfaction. Those are the ones who I opened the sermon with illustrating they fall away from faith. Listen, I know many people have gotten mad at the church. I probably made most of them mad. But did they have real solid Christ-centered faith? Or were they here for temporal gain and their own agenda? Just this past week, I watched a video clip again of a, of a former vocational minister who wrote book after book entitled, uh, basically telling people not even to kiss until you get married. And that's a whole different topic. We can talk about that. But, I mean, he was convicted of that. And, and in fact, he was asked, when did you kiss your wife for the first time? He said, the day I got married to her at the altar. He wrote book after book encouraging people. And about a year and a half ago, he walked away not just from pastoring, not just from his church, but he walked away from Jesus Christ, and his quote is, I don't even believe there's a God. Really? Did you not know, brother, the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom you preached about and wrote about to make money off of for all those years? Why do we follow Jesus? On the day of the triumphal entry, the people were waving palm branches Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And in just a few short days, most of those people were yelling what? Crucify him. Crucify him. He's not the king that we thought. He didn't do for us what we expected. He didn't come in a grand fashion. He rode on a donkey, preacher. A symbol of weakness and humility. That's not a king. He didn't defeat Rome for us and bring peace and prosperity. We're still struggling. Why do you follow Jesus? Why? Only you can answer that question. And I hope you can say, Brother Scott, I follow Jesus because he's God's Messiah and King. I follow him. I have identity in the Lord Jesus Christ of this Bible. And I follow him unashamedly because he's the only one who can give everlasting life to me and bring real peace and real satisfaction. And I will scream to the top of my lungs every day, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Let's pray.